Hey, lifers, Dustin here, and with week five of the 2017 college football season behind us, I figured I would take a few minutes to actually talk about some of the things that I think I learned from this past weekend, and more importantly, I want to hear what you guys learned as well. So, as we're going through this, if anything jumps out at you, make sure to let me know down in the comments section. The biggest thing I think I learned this weekend is that maybe, just maybe, Washington State is for real. Less than a year after watching the Pac-12 North title slip past them at a beatdown at home in the Apple Cup, there's a chance that the game against Washington in 2017 will once again be for the Pac-12 North title, and maybe, just maybe this time, for a potential playoff spot. Who saw that coming into the 2017 season? But the 30-27 win over 5th-ranked USC on Friday night at home in Martin Stadium has brought Washington State to the brink of their first top 10 win, nope, their first top 10 ranking since 2003. It was also their first win at home against a ranked opponent in 15 tries and their first top 5 win of any kind, of anywhere, in the last quarter century. I actually have a video talking a little bit more in depth on that scheduled to come out tomorrow, so definitely stay tuned Washington State fans. With a defense that can be at times quite impressive and quarterback Luke Falk, who never seems to really get rattled, who is very comfortable in this role, he's been doing it for a very long time at Washington State, it feels like he's going on his sixth or seventh year at this point, he is a leader, he can throw the ball, he's very accurate, not much of a runner, but in an offense like that you don't really need to be. With those ingredients in place, Washington State could potentially go pretty deep in 2017. Speaking of USC, this week I learned something that I think I had actually known the entirety of September, going all the way back to the opening win against Western Michigan, but it's something that I, I, I knew but I couldn't quite accept. And that is, something is wrong with Sam Darnold and this USC offense. Now, after 2016, Sam Darnold was the toast of Tinseltown after throwing for over 3,000 yards, 31 touchdowns, and just 9 interceptions after getting the start, I believe, in the third game of the season. After that game against Utah, they didn't lose again and were highly touted preseason favorites to definitely win the Pac-12, probably win the national championship, and Sam Darnold, one of the darlings of the preseason Heisman Trophy race, but... After throwing just nine interceptions in all of 2016, after five games, one month of the 2017 season, he already has eight. I feel like he's gotten a little bit better at making plays with his legs, but that's simply not enough. He has made plays to keep USC's head afloat, but there have also been times where, quite frankly, he's a liability to this team. Now, I don't think they should make a quarterback change. I highly doubt there's anybody else behind him on the roster that's quite as good and competent as he is, but something is definitely off. And I don't think it's just that he's missing targets that he would have made last season. I do think there's something with the pressure or his confidence or something that's just off. That's why for the first time this season, I actually took him off my top 10 Heisman watch list. That's a video you can check out here or down in the description box below. Who I replaced him with may interest you. This week I learned that I do believe that Alabama and Clemson are likely on a collision course for a third straight national championship game, which is unprecedented. I think that I will actually make a video on that going more in detail tomorrow. This week I learned the SEC is in trouble, specifically talking about Mississippi State, LSU, and Tennessee. For Mississippi State, two weeks ago, they were a team that trounced LSU by 30 points at home, and we were all wondering, how good can this Mississippi State team be? I actually had talked myself into thinking, maybe they're going to give Alabama a run for their money in the West. Maybe when they play Georgia and Auburn, if they can get past them, the only team left would be the Tide. Maybe Mississippi State could do some kind of a miracle season and then they had back-to-back -back blowout losses on the road against Georgia and Auburn. And now that win against LSU seems like a month ago rather than about 16 days ago. As for the team that beat them in the Auburn Tigers, Jared Stidham looks much more comfortable and much better in his role as quarterback 
Maybe it just took a couple of weeks for him to really get in the rhythm of a Gus Malzahn offense, really see some first significant playing time in a while since he was at Baylor. This is not the same Auburn team that went into Clemson a couple of weeks ago and got beat 14-6. to This is a much better team, a much more balanced attack. The running game is extremely good, and with games on the schedule still against Georgia and Alabama, they still have plenty of room for improvement in the polls and plenty of time to make a statement. This week, I learned that the men of Troy are better than the LSU Tigers. And I don't mean USC. I mean the men of Troy University, the Trojans football team. On the legs of running back Jordan Chun, who had 191 yards on the ground, the Troy Trojans from the Sun Belt, Sun Belt Fun Belt, went into Tiger Stadium and beat LSU at night on homecoming in a non-conference game. Ouch. Uh, that now led to this now infamous tweet that Troy University sent out that's just perfect. Now the question in Baton Rouge becomes, is Ed Orgeron, in only his fifth game as the official head coach of the LSU Tigers, is he on the hot seat? That seems kind of weird. Coming into the season, LSU was pretty highly touted. He did so good as an interim head coach last year. They strangled the Heisman Trophy winner, Lamar Jackson, in the Citrus Bowl. Everything seemed to be going great. But they just haven't delivered this season. Yeah, they had a good game against BYU, but they were way too close against Syracuse. They got destroyed by Mississippi State, and now they lost to a Sun Belt team at home on homecoming. And it wasn't just that they lost to Troy. Troy pushed them around for a lot of that game. It was 17 to nothing into the third quarter. This was not... Troy got lucky. This was LSU had to try to come back from behind by double digits in the fourth quarter to win kind of a game. And I don't want to throw salt in the wound of LSU fans right now, but I can't imagine for all of the ineptitude that his offenses at LSU had, the Les Miles LSU team would have lost to Troy at home. You have to wonder, if only for a moment if Ed Orgeron was a downgrade from the coach you had. This week I learned that officially, officially, there is no way that Butch Jones is going to be the head coach of the Tennessee Volunteers at the beginning of the 2018 college football season. I literally can't imagine it. Unless there's some kind of a weird, loopy miracle, like they beat Alabama by 30 in Tuscaloosa, or somehow flub their way into an SEC East championship, where again, by the way, they would they would probably play Alabama. I can't imagine, unless some kind of a miracle happens, that Butch Jones is not let go at the end of this year. Now, I do want to state, this is not some kind of a revelation, right? This is not something where I thought he was doing a bang -em up job until this week, and now I'm like, oh, heavens forbid, he's doing a terrible job. No, no, no. I know he's not doing the best job, and it's at a really tough job in a tough conference, pretty easy East schedule the last few years, but a tough conference overall. I understand all of that. But after a weekend where Tennessee had their worst home loss since 1905, the year before, somewhat fittingly, the signal SOS became an international distress signal, Butch Jones, the question starts to become not what can you do to save your job, but what will it take for you to be fired during the season? The rest of their schedule includes games against a scrappy South Carolina team, Alabama and Tuscaloosa. Butch Jones, I wouldn't even go to that one. Uh, Kentucky at Kentucky. Yes, I just name-dropped Kentucky as a potential pitfall for the Tennessee Volunteers in football. They also have home games in November against Southern Miss, LSU and a Vanderbilt team that beat them last year. So what would it take for Butch Jones to get fired in 2017? A 70-point loss to Alabama? A second loss to Kentucky since 1984? A loss to Southern Miss at home? A same Southern Miss team that lost to Kentucky by a touchdown? What will it take? Now don't get me wrong, I'm not rooting for him to get fired during the season. I actually tend to think that firing head coaches during the season does nothing but destroy the entire program. I guess 
occasionally you can rally around it. But I think for the most part, it just damages the players, it damages the school, and it damages the season. Uh, when you change management midstream, it always kind of tends to muck things up a little bit. But at this point, I don't think the fan base is going to allow that to happen. There was audible booing during the Tennessee game, most notably when the players were going to the locker room at halftime, but really just, just a random Dormandy incompletion. There would just be boos. The cameramen for CBS were just finding these players just resting their head on the concrete, just staring into nothing. They, they didn't want to be there. They were like hostages at this game. There were fistfights between Tennessee fans and the crowd. Not the first time. They did it in the Vanderbilt game last year, too, I believe. This is, this is a fan base that's literally tearing itself apart. I have seen a whole lot. I've seen pictures of just rolls and rolls of people who have changed their Twitter name, not their handle, but their Twitter name, to just Firebutch Jones. This is a fan base that is done with the dude. This is a Tennessee team that beat UMass, that had to, let me rephrase that, had to escape UMass at home. The same UMass team that is currently 0-6, and Coastal Carolina beat UMass by more points than Tennessee did, and Coastal is in their first year as a full FBS school. So to finish out this little mini rant, at this point, I don't know what Butch Jones has left in the tank emotionally, what this team has left in the tank as far as getting through the rest of the season, and certainly what this fan base and the athletic director have left in the tank as far as patience. Whew. Okay, enough about the SEC, at least for this week. The next thing I learned this week was that Oklahoma State is still a really good football team. After losing to TCU at home, I did wonder a little bit how they would bounce back, and they did exactly what they should do. They went into a hostile Texas Tech environment. The crowd was loud and into it the whole game. The game was back and forth between really good two really good offenses, and Oklahoma State prevailed. All three offensive superstars did exactly what they needed to do. Mason Rudolph threw for 376 yards and three touchdowns. Justice Hill had 164 yards on the ground. And James Washington had 127 receptions and a touchdown. I think I said 127 receptions. That would be an insane game. He had 127 receiving yards. They can now go into their bye week in peace instead of in pieces if they have dropped two games, including one to TTU. This week I learned... That's not true. This week, I reaffirmed that Stanford running back Bryce Love is an absolute monster. On just 25 carries, Love ran for 301 yards, which is a Stanford single-game rushing record, and three touchdowns, all three of which were from at least 43 yards out. Not only is Bryce Love the only running back in the country currently over 900 rushing yards, he's the only one over 1,000, and he will go over 1,100 in his next game. It's pretty incredible, especially when you consider he's ninth in the country in rushing attempts. Just one rushing attempt more than the supposed savior of Tennessee's offense and running back John Kelly, the person that the Vol Nation keeps yelling at Butch Jones to run more. To put that in perspective, John Kelly has 494 yards and a 5.1 yards per carry average, which is perfectly acceptable numbers through five games of the season. He should have more than that, but if you just look at the actual numbers, those are perfectly fine. To put that in comparison with just one more rush, Bryce Love has 1,088 yards and 11.1 yards per carry. The last thing I think I learned this week is that there's a really good chance that the UCF-USF game at the end of the season could be for a New Year's Six Bowl spot. Now, of course, San Diego State will have something to say about that as will Navy, who plays UCF on October 21st, and may end up playing the winner of that game in a American Conference Championship game as the representative of the American West. But there's a great chance that the winner of the UCF-USF game might be primed for a spot. The war on I-4 is certainly set to be a fun one, especially if players like Quentin Flowers... Mackenzie Milton and Adrian Killens Jr. can stay healthy and stay productive through the rest of the year. There's a great chance that this really fun game could be one of the highlights of the last weekend of college football. Who saw that in August? So that's it for me, guys. Those are the things that I think I learned this week. 
I'm not sure. I put this as what I learned. I'm pretty sure about most of them. But the beauty of college football is by this time next week, every single thing I said could be wrong. Clemson and Alabama could lose. Uh, Oklahoma State could get demolished. Butch Jones could beat somebody 100 to nothing. It's not going to happen. But this is what I know, what I learned right now from this past weekend. But now I want to hear from you guys. What is it that you learned this weekend, either about your team, your conference, or just college football in a whole? Nope. As a whole. In a whole sounds weird. As a whole. Let me know that down below in the comment section. I'm very curious to hear what kind of revelations you got this weekend. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, make sure to give it a big thumbs up. You can also click the circle right there in order to subscribe or watch any of the other videos over there to the right that YouTube has suggested for you. Thank you so much for watching. And as always, until next time. 30 to 27 win over fifth ranked USC on Friday night at home in Martin Stadium has brought Washington State to the brink of their first top 10 win. Nope. Their first top 10 ranking since 2003. It was also their first win at home against a ranked opponent in 15 tries and their first top five win of any kind, of anywhere, in the last quarter century. I actually have a video. Hey, lifers, Dustin here, and with week five of the 2017 college football season behind us, I figured I would take a few minutes to actually talk about some of the things that I think I learned from this past weekend, and more importantly, I want to hear what you guys learned as well. So, as we're going through this, if anything jumps out at you, make sure to let me know down in the comment section. The biggest thing I think I learned this weekend is that maybe talking a little bit more in depth on that scheduled to come out tomorrow, so definitely stay tuned Washington State fans. With a defense that can be at times quite impressive and quarterback Luke Falk, who never seems to really get rattled, who is very comfortable in this role, he's been doing it for a very long time at Washington State, it feels like he's going on his sixth or seventh year at this point. He is a leader, he can throw the ball, he's very accurate, not much of a runner, but in an offense like that, you don't really need to be. With those ingredients in place, Washington State could potentially go pretty deep in 2017. Speaking of USC, this week I learned something that I think I had actually known the entirety of September, going all the way back to the opening win against Western Michigan, but it's something that I, I, I knew but I couldn't quite accept. And that is, something is wrong with Sam. Just maybe, Washington State is for real. Less than a year after watching the Pac-12 North title slip past them at a beatdown at home in the Apple Cup, there's a chance that the game against Washington in 2017 will once again be for the Pac-12 North title, and maybe, just maybe this time, for a potential playoff spot. Who saw that coming into the 2017 season? But the